<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, we have uh, what I imagine is going to be a fascinating conversation. Uh, when I agreed to do this originally, I thought it was, uh, we were just going to talk about a book. Uh, but there has been a lot of news made, and a lot of news made literally in the past 24 hours. Uh, we will talk about the book, and we're going to talk about Howard's life. But given all of the cameras here, I think we need to spend some time talking to Howard about the decision that he just made. Um, so I'm just going to start with that. I interviewed you in June when you stepped down uh, from Starbucks, and you talked about the possibility of running for president or of public service, yes. hinted potentially at the presidency, but you never talked about running as an independent. There are lots of questions about that decision, which you made clear on 60 Minutes last night. So let's start there, which is to say, what happened between last June and now, and how did you decide specifically, not just to consider the option to run for president, but specifically to run as an independent? Uh, okay. Uh, let me first say thank you for being here. I know you're under the weather, and I appreciate the fact that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, let's begin with what I said on national TV last night so I can frame the answer. Uh, what I said last night is that I am seriously considering running for president as a centrist independent. And I wanted to clarify the word independent, which I view uh, merely as a designation on the ballot. And Don't what, help elect Trump, you egotistical billionaire. We're going to get to that idea and that sentiment <laughs> in just a minute uh, because there is a lot on Twitter today. But before we do that, yeah, let me let, let, let's go back. Let, let, let's go back and, and let me uh, finish your answer. Yeah, let me. Uh, uh, you know, I think what this gentleman just said. I, I recognize there is a lot of concern and perhaps misunderstanding, and I hope that this conversation will be quite illuminating and people will understand uh, why I feel so strongly about the direction of the country and how profoundly concerned I am about where we all stand. Having said that, I, I think the question that I've been asking myself for the past year and a half is what kind of country do we want to live in? And as a result of, the, of trying to answer that question and the concern and the profound issues that the country is facing, what I said last night, and I'll repeat, is that I am seriously considering running for president as a centrist independent. And, um, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and if I do, uh, what I want to try and do is run as an American under one banner, the American <coughs> flag. Now, what's changed for me in terms of the specific, specific of the question is that over the last two years, uh, we've seen a president and an administration uh, demonstrate a lack of leadership, a lack of truth. Uh, there's no dignity, there's no civility in the Oval Office, and that has given license and incitement uh, to people throughout the country to feel as if uh, they can do and say anything they want that would disrupt the values and the promise of the country. In addition to that, uh, and I don't want to be misunderstood by this, I think that we're living at a time when the toxicity of both parties have, have reached <coughs> a point where there's just no level of compromise. And we, we've witnessed just in the last month uh, what better evidence do we need of the government shutting down and 800,000 people and their families uh, have to go to a pawn shop, have to sell clothes, have to go to a food bank <coughs> because Sorry. the government is shut down over what? Over politics and the ridiculous nature of a wall. And so what I'm asking my, myself a question is, is there a better way? And I, I think that there's evidence that the government is not trusted, the government is not working, that both parties are complicit uh, in their inability to kind of walk in the shoes of the American people. And, and lastly, I'd say this, that there are Republicans and Democrats who are really good people on both sides of the aisle. 
who want to vote with their heart and their conscience and represent the American people. However, and this is really important, they're unable to do what they believe is right <coughs> because they are steeped in the ideology of their party and they realize if they vote their conscience or their heart, they're going to get primaried and taken out. And so we're living at a time right now where both parties fighting each other every day in what I would call revenge politics are not doing the work that is necessary to move the country forward. And what I would say, just as a long answer, is that one thing we should think about, all of us while we're here today, is think about if you have children, if you have grandchildren, what kind of country do you want for them? And what I believe right now, as we're all sitting here, is that there's an opportunity for a better choice. And the choice is whether or not to embrace the broken system and the status quo, which will lead to decline, or what better expression of our democracy than to give the American people another choice. And let the Amer American people decide. And I think that choice potentially has the possibility to lead to a season of renewal. Okay, but let, let me just, though, speak to what that gentleman uh, just said in maybe more polite terms. Okay. Um, there are a lot of people that think that if you decide to run as an independent, you will prove to be a spoiler. Uh, this is Mayor Bloomberg on Twitter just today. In 2020, the great likelihood is that an independent would just split the anti-Trump vote and end up re-electing the president. That's a risk I refused to run in 2016, and we can't afford to run it now. Yeah. How, do, how do you respond to Mayor Bloomberg, somebody who has spent a lot of time and a lot of money yeah. studying this very <clears throat> issue? Well, I think uh, Mike Bloomberg has built a great business, was a great mayor. I have tremendous respect for him. Uh, but I don't agree with his conclusion. And let me try and, and state the facts and why I, I've come at this in a different way. And I think these, these, are, these are facts, not things that are made up. So as we sit here today, most people don't realize that about 42% of the electorate self-affiliates themselves, identifies themselves as an independent. 30% are registered, and another 12% affiliate themselves as an independent. Now, those 42% have never had a legitimate choice to vote for what they believe in. So they've had to vote for Democrat or Republican. I also believe that there are lifelong Democrats and lifelong Republicans who are, will likely want to find a new home. Nobody wants to see Donald Trump fired and leave office more than me. I am in this because I love the country and I'm profoundly concerned with the direction we're in. And I believe, let's, let's, let me travel the country over the next three months and let the American people decide. I don't believe in what Michael Bloomberg has stated. Okay, this is uh, the president who did react to you uh, on Twitter <laughs> today. Howard Schultz doesn't have the guts to run for president. Watched him on 60 Minutes last night, and I agree with him that he is not the smartest person. <laughs> Besides, America already has that. I only hope that Starbucks is still paying me their rent in Trump Tower. When the president is effectively goading you, taunting you to run, how can that be a good sign? Well... If you look at the decisions and the level of leadership that this president has presented to the American people, I think he's been on the wrong side of almost every issue. And he's clearly on the wrong side of the issue. I, I, I also would say that I don't think we should uh, misjudge what the president views as strength uh, and conviction, it's really weakness. Uh, th this has nothing to do with uh, what's true and what's real. Uh, I'm not gonna respond to that, it's childish. And I I'm not trying to win the Twitter primary. Uh, okay. You know. I am gonna try one more tweet out on you, but more so because sure. I think it would, speaks to the issue that I think so many people here wanna understand. Sure. Which is to, Take us inside the room and just take us through the thinking 
of the math, okay. how it's possible. And okay. let me just say this. This is Howard Wolfson. Uh, Wolfson. He is a, a Democratic strategist, uh, worked for, for Mayor Bloomberg. He says, I've seen enough data over many years to know that anyone running for POTUS as an independent will split the anti-incumbent, anti-Trump vote. The stake could not be higher, and we cannot afford the risk of a spoiler. He goes on uh, effectively to repeat what, what the mayor said. But, yeah. but walk us through almost state by state how okay. you'd have to do it. Okay. Uh, for, I don't know Mr. Wolfson. Uh, I'm sure he has a vested interest in the Democratic Party. Uh, but let me try and answer your question. Uh, certainly for the last three or four or even five presidential elections, basically less than 10 states, battleground states, have pretty much decided the election. So if you live in Arizona or Montana, pretty much your voice and your vote has not mattered. So if you just pause on that for a moment, and realize that seven to 10 states are deciding the presidential election in the future of this country, I would submit there perhaps is not, that's not the way we should proceed. So what if the possibility existed that all 50 states, that everyone's vote mattered, that everyone's voice mattered, and what if an independent candidate could create a 50 state race? So what I said on national TV last night is that if I proceed and decide to run for president as an independent, that we, had, we have done the work to unequivocally answer the question that we will be on the ballot of every state, all 50 states, in every district, in every county, and for the first time in maybe 30 to 40 years, every voice and every vote and every state would matter. In addition to that, if I have 15% polling, by the time the primaries are over, I have the right to be on the debate stage. And then it becomes a three-person race. Let me go a step further. Donald Trump, if he is the Republican nominee, and there's probably some questions about that, uh, he has a base of roughly 30 to 35 percent that is a strong Republican base. I understand that. I respect it. Hypothetically, if you kind of look at the tea leaves today, it appears that the Democratic Party is shifting far, far left with very strong progressive ideas, the likes of which we should talk about. Those two extremes, far left, far right, do not represent the silent majority of Americans. And they certainly don't represent the 42% who affiliate themselves as independent. So I believe there is a path to 270 if, in fact, I, I were to proceed. But most importantly, it would not be decided on 8 to 10 states. It would be a 50-state race for the first time in probably 40 years. Again, I asked the question, what better expression of our democracy than an 8-state election cycle versus all 50 states and every American who has an opportunity to vote. As you saw the reaction uh, today, which was swift from many in the Democratic Party, there were some, not only who said don't run as an independent, but some said, come over to this other side. Come to our side over here, uh -huh. these Democrats were saying. Is it possible over the next three months as you tour the country and, and put your finger in the wind that you might say, you know what, I've thought about it and I want to run as a Democrat? You've been a lifelong Democrat. Well, uh, the, way I've, the way I've come to this decision is I believe that if I ran as a Democrat, I would have to say things that I know in my heart I do not believe and I would have to be disingenuous. For example, what the progressive left-leaning Democratic Party is suggesting is government-paid health care for everyone, uh, which is free, government job free for everyone, and government-paid college for everyone. Now, I'll, I'll talk specifically about the fact that I, I was a supporter and am a supporter of the Affordable Care Act, which I think can be improved 
and, and enhanced so that the premiums come down for families. But if you tally up those three programs over a 10 year period, it's approximately $40 trillion. And ladies and gentlemen, we are sitting right now with a national debt of $21.5 trillion on the balance sheet of our country. And if we were a company, if America was a company at $21.5 trillion of debt, adding a trillion dollars a year, we would be facing insolvency. And so... Healthcare is a human right! So I... Healthcare is a human right! Uh, In any event, uh, let me ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. I'm going to. I'm. I'm going to, sir. I'm, I'm actually going to get to your question. I'm going to ask it like this. Uh, this at <laughs> this afternoon, I'd asked on Twitter, yeah. as it happens, I said I was going to be here. We'd have a live audience. Are there any questions you'd want Mr. Schultz to answer? And one of them came from a reporter at the Washington Post, uh, David Weigel. He said Starbucks is a global company operating in many countries that have universal health care. Yes. Why does he believe that a similar healthcare system is unworkable here? Okay, good, good. Uh, very good question. Uh, let's, let's take the state of California as a proxy. The state of California approximately has a state budget of $150 billion. Um, the formula that is being suggested by Governor Newsom which is a proxy for health care for everybody, is $400 billion on a state budget of 150. The math doesn't work. Now, what I do believe, and this is vitally important, is I believe that every American has the right to affordable health care. But there are other ways to get at this in which private enterprise, my company, which is a scalable opportunity. My company provides free health insurance for our employees. And our stock price and our performance has done well. It's scalable. More companies should be doing the same thing. In addition to that, pharmaceutical companies are, I don't want to say taking advantage of, but pharmaceutical companies have more lobbyists in Washington, D.C. that are preventing, once again, our elected officials of doing the right thing to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies to get prescription drugs, drugs down to a price that is reasonable and there's no transparency in the system. So the entire system of health care needs to be reviewed and transformed and reimagined. Reimagined with the goal and the objective to provide health care for everyone, but not on the, on the burden of the United States government when we're facing a $21 trillion debt. It's unrealistic. Let me, just, let me just follow up on that, which is, we started this question uh, before we were interrupted yeah. about the idea of you ever running as a Democrat. Yeah. Is there any opportunity for you to say, look, I've been a lifelong Democrat, I'm going to run as a Democrat, I'm going to actually move the party to where you think you are? No. Uh, if I run for president, I'm running as a centrist independent because I believe the American people deserve a different choice. But, but I think one thing that we're missing here, and I think I want to go back to it, I'm not running against anyone. I'm not running against the Democrats. I'm not running against the Republican Party. What I believe is that the system, our political system, is broken. And, and there's so much evidence of this. The $21 trillion debt, 79% of the American people want to see a common sense solution on immigration. But look, we don't get it. And we can't get it because the two parties are stuck, steeped in their own ideology and unwilling to reach a compromise that the American people want. Our healthcare system is broken. Our education system is broken. Our standing in the world is very fragile. And all of these things, if a Democrat were to win the White House in 2020, is there any evidence to anyone here that our political system all of a sudden is going to change and people are going to start working together? There's no evidence of that whatsoever. So can you imagine this? Can you imagine for the first time since George Washington that an independent person could ignite a national movement to say it's time for us to come together? 
to send a powerful, strong, robust message to everyone in DC that we want change, real change. We want to reimagine the system, we want to disrupt it. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to have the, a vision to see a new kind of government. But if the American people sent that message to Washington, we would get real change for the first time and we would not have to embrace the status quo of a broken political system. Let me ask you, me ask you one final follow-up on this particular issue, which is given the history of Ross Perot and Nader and Jill Stein and the list goes on, if it appeared in the polls, if, if you were running and it appeared in the polls that your candidacy would help reelect Donald Trump, would you drop out beforehand? Let me go back to what I said earlier. Uh, nobody wants to see Donald Trump removed from office more than me. If I decide to run for president as an independent, I will believe and have the conviction and the courage to believe that I can win. I can't answer that question today, but I'm certainly not going to do anything to put Donald Trump back in the Oval Office. Let me ask you a question that might be put under the umbrella about the American dream, because in many ways you are the embodiment of it. However, um, this is AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know her. I imagine, I don't know if you know her personally. I, I do not. She, um, she, she was born in Queens, I think, right? Or, she, she um, <laughs> not Brooklyn. Uh, her, her, uh, her advisor says that every billionaire, and you are one of them, is a policy failure. Meaning that the, the, the capitalistic society that we live in today is, struck, is, is improperly structured, and that actually your success uh, or, and, and becoming a billionaire um, is a failure of the system. What do you think of that? It's so un-American to think that way. First off, uh, I'm self-made. Uh, as you said, I, I, I came from the projects and took advantage of the promise of the country. I'm living proof of the American dream and the aspiration, the magnetism, uh, and, and the opportunities that were presented to me. I think there is a problem that she has identified, but I think the way she's going about it, unfortunately, she's a, a bit misinformed. The problem is we have significant inequality in the country. The problem is we have about 40% of American families that literally don't have $400 for a crisis. We have roughly 5 million young people, many African American, Latino, that are not in school, not in work, and we, one out of every six Americans are food insecure every night. So she's identified issues that have to be fixed, but not to do it in a way that's punitive to people who have succeeded because of the foundation and the gift and the promise of the country. So when President Trump issued a new tax policy that took the corporate tax rate from 35 to 21 percent, I was with you on television that day yep. and said, I thought this was a terrible mistake, that it was fool's gold, that to reward corporations and not look at it as an opportunity for comprehensive tax reform and give the people who need it the most relief was a tremendous missed opportunity. In addition to that, there's a great opportunity for infrastructure development in America that could create jobs, but specifically in a different way. And the different way is not to think about infrastructure only as roads and bridges, but FDR did something in the 30s where he said electricity should be a, a right of every American family. High-speed internet should be a right of every American family. And 25% of American families that live in rural America do not have an internet hookup. It's, it's, it's just, it's not right. So the inequality is real and must be addressed, but not in a punitive way. What is required is leadership. What is required is leadership that the country can trust and that the government is working for them. What we have right now is a void of trust in our leaders and a void of trust in our government. And what I'm suggesting is we must take a step back from all of this and realize something. This is not to sound negative, but to be truthful. We can't continue like this. 
We can't continue to add on to the debt. We can't continue to add on to the inequality. But we can solve these problems if we come together and reimagine the fact that we must change the way we're doing our business. And not that Washington is solely responsible for this, because I do feel that corporate America, the rules of engagement have changed, and businesses must do more for their people and the communities we serve. But we can't continue just like this, because think we are on a collision course with time if we continue to embrace a broken government and the level of toxicity that exists among the two parties. I am not running against the Democrats. I am running, if I run for president, to try and provide a different and a better solution to solve these systemic problems that have been with us for a long time that need to be addressed with truth and honesty and sincerity, and most importantly, a degree of empathy and compassion for the millions of Americans who are being left behind. And I can say that because I was one of those kids. I grew up in the projects. I still have the scars and vulnerability, and I write about it in the book. I'm wearing a suit, and I'm successful, but I still have the insecurity of what it meant and the shame of what it meant to be a poor kid in the projects. I don't want that to continue for those kids in the projects today who do not have the same opportunity that I had because of the systemic problems that exist in our country. Let me ask you one final question about the system and, and the capitalistic system of money and what it may or may not be doing to politics. And then I want to get into your story okay. and being uh, in the projects and where you came from, because I think there's some uh, instructive and important uh, items to talk about. But uh, the author of Winner Takes All sent in a question and said, do you agree that billionaires have too much power in American public life? And it, gets, it yeah. gets at the issue that, that AOC has been talking about. It gets at the issue that Elizabeth Warren has been right. talking about. It gets at... Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the moniker billionaire now has become the, the catchphrase. I would rephrase that, and I would say that people of, of means have been able to leverage their wealth and their interest uh, in ways that are unfair. And I think that speaks to the inequality but it also directly speaks to the special interests that are paid for by people of wealth and corporations who are looking for influence. And they have such unbelievable influence on the politicians who are steeped in the ideology of both parties. And once again, I go back to this. If I should run for president, I am not in bed with any party. I am not in bed with any special interest. All I'm trying to do is one thing, walk in the shoes of the American people. Okay. Um, let, let's talk about Canarsie and the projects okay. and how it all began. And I've now read the book twice. And I'm, I'm actually selfishly very curious about this. Uh, you, you write uh, very emotionally about your relationship with your father. Mm -hmm. um, your father beat you when you were 15 years old. There's this remarkable scene in the book uh, where you uh, talk about him literally going into the shower and beating you in blood, uh, rushing, uh, rushing down into the, into, the shower, uh, into the shower drain. And then at the same time, you also talk about him in the context of going to baseball games with him and these, these great moments. And you also talk about him in the creation of Starbucks and in building a company that you say um, is a company that, you, that your father never had a chance to work for. And so I was trying to understand... Do you love your father? Do you hate your father? And how much of all of this, all of whatever has motivated you, is about your father? I didn't know this was going to be a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think uh, everyone here wants to make their parents proud. Uh, I had a difficult relationship with my father. I wrote about that, I think, with great honesty and great vulnerability. Um, there were certainly moments of bitterness and uh, I don't want to use the word hate, but I, you, know, you, you get beat up in a way that you can't go to school for a couple of days. You're certainly feeling a tremendous level of... By your father. By my father. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think I resolved it towards the end. I, I love my parents. Uh, I think most of the motivation that I've had 
uh, is because of the scars and the shame of what I experienced as a kid and trying to overcome the fear of failure. I know everything I've tried to do at Starbucks was to honor the dignity of work that my father didn't experience as a laborer. Um, but I, it was a complicated relationship and uh, one that I think uh, still trying to sort out in a way. And, and the book in many ways was very therapeutic because I, I never revealed any of these stories other than to my wife Sherry and uh, even my brother and sister uh, who are here tonight didn't know everything because they were much younger. When you said that you wanted to build a company that your father had a, never had a chance to work for, what did you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, my father came back from World War II uh, damaged. Uh, he would never, there was never a conversation in his entire life about what happened in the war. So we never knew anything. But he did come back with yellow fever. Um, he was a high school dropout, did not take advantage of the GI Bill, and as a result, had a series of just terrible blue collar jobs. And over a period of years, he began to feel as if he was a victim of the system. Now, I will say publicly, I, I don't think he took the responsibility that was necessary to do the things he needed to do to put himself in a position to win. But he viewed himself as a victim. He was bitter, he was angry, and he was not dignified and not respected and not valued as a worker. And, and that, to me, was what I tried to reverse at Starbucks. And so before we were public and still losing money, not only did we provide health insurance, because I remember losing health insurance, I remember the Jewish Family Services actually delivering food to our house, our apartment, when there was no food, there was no money. And you, you, don't, you don't forget these things. And then, obviously, equity in the form of stock options. My parents never owned anything in their entire life. And so giving somebody who worked on a factory floor or a part-time barista equity in the company and a billion and a half dollars 20 years later has gone back to people at Starbucks because they had ownership in the company. And now, interestingly enough, shareholders who were private and then public tried to fight me on all of these benefits because they viewed it as being dilutive to their ownership. And what I tried to say then and what we proved is that if you treat people with great respect, if you do everything you can to demonstrate that every business decision is not an economic one, that there's a great opportunity for higher performance, lower attrition, and most importantly, people feeling as if they're part of something larger than themselves. Starbucks has almost 400,000 people in 77 countries. The reason for that is not because we have special technology or some secret sauce. It's because of the culture and values of the company, and that is humanity, and it's also an American value an American value that we've taken all over the country with the American flag and said it's the idealism and the promise of the country that built this company. So when I hear a congresswoman say success is not, should be, not to be valued, I, I disagree with that completely because the entire country is based on opportunity. It also speaks to immigration. You know, right now, we're, we're, if you look at what we're trying to do in terms of this administration, we are a country of immigrants. Almost 99% of everyone here tonight is here because someone else came to this country who was not born here. How could we turn our backs on the opportunity to invite people in who want to do good things? And it's also an economic driver. We are not in, we should, America should not be building walls we should be building bridges. That is the spirit of the country. So, so Howard, help us with this. If I could put you on this bipartisan committee that now has three weeks to try to figure out a plan, yeah. and it relates to the wall and it relates to immigration, what would yeah. you do? I gotta tell you, I think this is the most simple problem to solve. Uh, maybe I'm just stupid. Uh, uh, this, I, I can't figure it out. So the Republicans want something that is correct, and they want strong border security. I agree with that completely. But a wall? So I went to the southern border 
And when, Pre when President Bush was president, he actually built elements of a wall. And for some reason, there's hundreds of openings in the wall that exist today. So people can walk in and out. We also have learned that people will build tunnels under a wall. We have the most advanced, sophisticated tech companies in the world that are doing things way beyond creating border security. You get them in a room and you say, I want you to solve the problem of border security, leveraging every aspect of American if, technology. If they said that any element of that required a wall or required it, fencing, no, but you I've, would say what? Well, I've spoken to these people, and it does not require fencing, and it does not require a wall. So, so the Republicans want border security. I agree with that. The Democrats, in a sense, want to get rid of ICE. I think that's, that's wrong. We, we need border patrol because bad people do want to come in. But should we have kids in internment camps? Should we have mothers stripped away from kids? No. Now, with regard to solving the problem, the country is steeped in a foundation of humanity. Humanity, that is an American virtue. So I look at the dreamers. Don't they have a right to become citizens? And wouldn't it be a tragedy and almost inhumane to send them back so the dreamers should have access to citizenship. And then the 11 million or 12 million unauthorized people who are here, let's, let's examine each one of them in terms of their history, let them pay taxes if they haven't, let them pay a fee, let them get in line, and a legal way for a pathway to citizenship. And let me, this is very important. President Bush and President Obama a Republican president and a Democratic president, both individually presented to the American people and to a Congress a opportunity for comprehensive immigration reform. And what happened? A Republican president offered it up, and a Democratic House turned it down. A Democratic president offered it up, and a Republican House turned it down. Why? Simply because it was based on politics and not allowing the other side to win. The question in front of us all is, it's time for America to win, for our people to win, and put politics aside, and let's realize that we must come together as a country. Immigration is not a serious problem. That, immigration is a serious problem, but it is a problem that can be easily solved if you have the right mentality and a lens of humanity to try and solve it. Let me ask you, since we're talking about policy, and I do want to get back to Starbucks because I do have one important yeah. question that I think relates to how you got here in terms of thinking. But to the extent that you've spent a lot of time traveling the world uh, on behalf of Starbucks, to the extent that you've spent a lot of time in China in particular where really the growth of, of Starbucks has, it has come over the past several years, yeah. what do you think of the trade war that's happening between the US and China, and what feels like a sea change between this idea of cooperation to confrontation. And I'm not just talking about the tariffs, which may or may not get sorted out over the next month or two. I'm talking about a much larger debate that seems to be happening that may play out over the next decade or more. I think this is a, a very serious question, Andrew, so I, I want to try and, and frame my answer appropriately. Uh, the question that the next president needs to carefully ask and answer is what is in America's national interest? And uh, let me just answer the question in a different way first. And I just ask rhetorically, is it in our national interest over the last two years to basically ostracize ourselves from countries within the EU, from NATO, and put ourselves in a position where we are operating alone on the basis of nationalism and isolating ourselves to the point where we are walking away from our allies. I would suggest that's not in our national interest. There are people on the other side who would say that it has been an unfair deal. Well, now we're getting to China, so I'm going to... Uh, China and, uh, and, and okay. beyond. Okay. Yeah, but there are, whether or not it's an unfair deal, you don't take your ball and run away, and this is not the way to proceed. America, the world needs American leadership, 
and our allies have to rely on the trust and confidence of America's military and America's defense. With regard to China, which is your question, is first off, what, what, what role does China play with regard to America? Is, uh, is China a adversary? Is China an enemy? Is China a competitor? And I would suggest that China is a fierce competitor. What China is looking to do is establish themselves and displace us economically as the world's strongest economic power. Uh, we, we cannot allow that to take place. It is in our national interest to make sure that America continues to lead economically in the world. So the first mistake that the president made was leaving TPP and as a result of that giving China the opportunity to basically control and influence the most important growth aspect of the world, which is the Asia-Pacific region, and then go about it in a way that we are no longer involved. Now, we have significant issues and challenges with China with regard to manipulation of currency, specifically on trade and human rights issues. But we are now in a trade war with China that has no strategic understanding about what it is we're trying to do and what it is we're trying to accomplish because as we sit today we have an entire agricultural industry farmers across the country who have lost markets as a result of this and those markets are not coming back and on top of that as a result of the trade and tariff war that is insane in my view the American consumer is now paying a tax because goods and services are costing more so what is necessary is to recognize it is in our national interest to figure out a way in which we can create a co-authored long-term strategy with China in which we can coexist and we need China for two very specific things long-term negotiation with North Korea and we also need China to help us solve the issue around global warming and the climate issue and we need China to participate in that with us so in my view, diplomacy, statesmanship, and what we're doing now is not the way to proceed in China. Now, I've been doing business in China for 20 years. I probably have been to China more than almost any other public CEO. We have to have a tough, stern conversation with China, but it has to be respectful, and they need to understand what we stand for. And I could say, if I ran for president, and if I was fortunate enough to be president, we would achieve these goals but in a much different method. Let me, let me ask you this. I mentioned uh, politics before, and, and I just wanted to get at this because it is something in the book that struck me as I was reading it. When do you think you became interested in politics and even thinking yourself about both the role that you could play and the company could play? There, there seems to be a turning point, I think, that you talk about in your book in 2011. Uh, you're, you're stretched out on a couch, I think, uh, because you, you, had, you just had some surgery. And you came back to the company and said that you were going to put out a memo to uh, other executives saying to hold, uh, to withhold financial contributions until there could be bipartisan uh, coming together. What, what was that about? Am I well, right about that? Yeah, you're right. Thank you for reading the book, by the way. <laughs> you know, because some people fake it. Uh, I did read it. Um, so in 2011, I, I had a, uh, a neck fusion surgery, so I was pretty, pretty much laid out for a few weeks. And I had a lot of time on my hands, so I'm reading, uh, I'm watching television, and um, uh, it really concerned me that we were facing another gridlock in the government and another example of two parties not working together on behalf of the American people. And I, I was just thinking that the role and responsibility of a public company, that the rules of engagement were changing, and we needed to speak up. And one way we could speak up is not make a, any contribution to a Republican and Democrat. So I, I solicited the help of my friends, and 150 CEOs of both parties signed a petition that we were not going to contribute any money until the government reopened and that there was some basis of, of compromise with regard at the time to the fiscal cliff that we were dealing with. Um, I think that was one uh, turning point, but the real turning point has been the last two years 
the last two years of seeing this president and this administration fail the American people in ways that are just, in my view, unacceptable. The American people deserve better, and we are much better than our political class. What do you think, though, of companies and other CEOs now getting into the world of politics, not just the yeah. way you are, but jumping into these issues? Appropriate? Inappropriate? I think it's appropriate if they're not using their company as a political tool. I, I think a company has to have a history, culturally, of being engaged in these things uh, and not just as a one-off. And I think at Starbucks, what we tried to do is not be political, but we tried to elevate the national conversation on things that we thought were important. And things didn't always turn out well. I was criticized for a lot of things. Uh, but I felt that I was always trying to make our people and our customers proud of what Starbucks stood for. Right. Um, I'm curious what you think about the potential impact. If you decide to run, and even what's been floated thus far, the impact actually on Starbucks and its employees. Uh, when Mitt Romney ran, uh, Bain Capital, uh, it was almost a referendum on the private equity industry. There have been already, as you saw, calls for boycotts of Starbucks. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Let me give you a story that uh, really upset me and concerned me at the time. Um, I've been very concerned about racial inequality in America and, as you know, tried to uh, elevate the national co conversation about racism and uh, kind of failed twice in trying to do that. Uh, I'm proud of the initiative, but the execution didn't go all that well. So. During the time that we were trying to elevate the national conversation on race together, uh, I got a phone call from a store in the South. And the phone call was, uh, we, we, we had a white customer today who refused to be served by an African-American barista. And I, it broke my heart. And I, I honestly, I, I couldn't believe that that was going on. And then a day later, uh, we had another incident where we were told that there was a gunshot uh, through a window at Starbucks in another city. It turned out to be not a gunshot, but a ball bearing from a slingshot that actually could have killed somebody. And so I think we, what we understood and what I feel very strongly about is we've got to be very careful uh, not to be in the business of incitement. And certainly we're living at a time of incitement. We've got to be very respectful of, of people's beliefs. Uh, and I think one thing that I would hope that this conversation and the conversation I hope to have over the next three months leads to the fact that we can disagree. Uh, we're not going to agree on all issues. But one thing, we are all Americans. We must come together. And we can agree to disagree if we can move the country forward. Uh, you talked about professional mistakes a moment ago, and I want to ask you about one in particular because you talk about it in the book. Um, there are a lot of people in Seattle that are still very unhappy that you sold the Sonics in 2006. Uh, this is a real issue. Uh, some of you are clapping and laughing, but there are a lot of people. You go to Seattle, um, and this is something that you are remembered for. You write in the book... Um, Almost everyone blamed me, and after some initial denial, I realized they were right to do so. I had squandered the very public trust that I had bought into. You went to go on to say losing the Sonics has been tragic for generations of fans, especially kids who are growing up without the benefit of an NBA team in their city. It's a public wound I cannot heal. For that, I will forever be deeply sorry. How often do you actually think about that? I think about it a lot in Seattle, especially when I see uh, a young kid wearing a, a supersonic jersey. Uh, so uh, what I wrote about in the book is how I feel. I, I, I think the lesson for me is uh, when you have power and responsibility, you have to show restraint. And uh, there are a lot of issues that led to the sale of the Sonics. And I look back on it as certainly the biggest professional mistake I made. I wish I could redo it, but I can't. Uh, I have, I've apologized for it. Uh, there's nothing I can do or say. Uh, and I think back to, you know, when my father, uh, when the Brooklyn Dodgers left Brooklyn, how upset he was uh, at the O'Malley family at the time. Now I'm going, you know, way back to Ebbets Field. Uh, so this was a, a big mistake on my part. I'm human. I'm not perfect. Uh, I can't undo it, and I feel terrible about it. And I'm going to have to address this 
publicly in Seattle on Thursday night in a, in a group like this. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be some people who Do people will... come up to you still? Yeah, yes, they do. They do. Yeah. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, and I know that there's a lot of cards here that people have uh, asked questions on, um, and I, I want to get to them. I want to ask you, because we really only have five minutes, you did say that you are going to spend the next several months making a decision about what to do next. Yes. Talk us about the calculus. What, how, how are you going to think about this? What would, what would make you run? Okay. What would make you decide, you know what, I'm not doing this? Uh, well, one thing that's not going to change is my profound concern for the direction of the country and our standing in the world. And, and can, can, I, can I just tell a brief story? Yeah. I know it's going to, and I'm gonna, then I'll answer the question. So uh, Sherry and I had an opportunity to uh, visit Normandy this past year. And um, I've always wanted to go to Normandy, but never had the opportunity. How, how many people have been to Normandy? So I think th those of you who have been, I think you'll understand this story. Uh, you go to Normandy and you walk Omaha, Omaha Beach and you are struck with the unbelievable level of bravery and valor and sacrifice of extraordinary people who gave their lives uh, for freedom and saved the world. And then you go to the cemetery and you walk through 9,300 headstones and you are just in awe of that generation. And as we were leaving Normandy and we're in the parking lot, uh, a car pulled up next to us, and we heard American voices. And I got out of the car, and it was a young couple from Baltimore, Maryland. She was a nurse, and he was a lawyer. And I simply said, what, what brought you to Normandy today? And she didn't miss a beat, not a beat. And she said, we came to Normandy to be reminded of who we once were. And it just it was like a spear that went through my heart, that this young couple had to go to Normandy to find who we once were. You can almost cry hearing that. And I know in my heart who we are. I know who we can be. And I had a second situation in Normandy. About an hour before that, I'm walking through the cemetery, and we kind of split up, and I'm by myself. And about 100 yards away is, a, is somebody on his hands and knees. And I can see he's in a uniform. And I walk towards him, I get really close, and I'm like five yards away, and he's on his knees. And I get to him, and he's got a hand scrub brush, and he's scrubbing the headstone. And I look at him, I realize he's an employee of the American Cemetery, but he's French. I kneel down next to him, and I say, thank, just thank you for what you're doing. And he stands up, not a word of English, and he says, thank you to me the respect that he was showing on his knees, scrubbing the headstone of Americans who had fallen, who had sacrificed so much. That Normandy experience is what I'm carrying with me. And that's why I've made the statement of what I'm considering doing, because of my love of the country and my personal responsibility that no one should have to go to Normandy to find who we are. I know who we are, and we could be so much better. With regard to your question, Sherry and I and our kids will, will huddle and try and figure this thing out over the next three months. It takes a tremendous amount of sacrifice from our family. And then I will Is see. Is everybody all in? Uh, Some of them are here. They're all here. Uh, yeah. You've got to be careful with that question. Uh, it depends how well we do tonight. Uh, but, and, then, and then I think we will see over the next three months if we can ignite a national movement for a better choice. OK, one of the uh, questions that came in was this. It, it's similar to something I asked before, but I'm going to put a, a little twist on it. It says President Trump uh, just attacked your appearance on 60 Minutes. Uh, how would you take on his attacks on the campaign trail? And I, I'd add to that question, your disposition and President Trump's disposition are very different. Uh, he oh, I'm, is I'm from Brooklyn. historically a fighter. <laughs> How do you, as somebody who I think tries to keep things relatively civil mm. in most cases, yeah. how do you fight a fighter without fighting? Well, first off, I think President Trump is a, a very insecure man. Uh, and that insecurity is manifested with all of these attacks, which I really view as weakness, not as strength. Uh, 
And so we're not going to get in the mud with him. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to represent the American people with dignity and respect. I, I, it's a question that I understand that people will have a natural feeling of, but no one should doubt whatsoever the toughness and the rigor and the grit that I have to do everything I can to represent the American people well. Okay. It's a variation on a question I asked earlier, but put in probably a better way than I asked it, which is, what do the Democrats have to do to change your mind and run? Is there anything they could do? Uh, no. I, I think uh, I, I respect uh, the Democratic Party. I no longer feel affiliated because I don't think their views represent the majority of Americans. I don't think we want a 70% income tax in America, and I certainly don't believe we can afford the things that they are suggesting. I, I do believe that with imagination and innovation and getting great, smart people in a room, we can solve these problems and get America going again. Okay. Uh, geopolitical question. Um, foreign, foreign relations. Do you have a take on what's happening in Syria? Yes. So uh, Syria uh, is a terrible, terrible story in a number of ways. But Syria has been a proxy war, basically, between the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, and the Kurds have been side by side with American forces to prevent, basically, what has occurred there under a terrible ruler. President Trump's decision to abdicate our responsibility in Syria will go down in history as one of the biggest mistakes that a president has made with regard to foreign policy. And the reason is this. By abdicating our responsibility, he did a few things that are so wrong. One, he did not share on any level what his intent was with our allies. Mistake number one. Number two, by leaving Syria, he allows Russia, whose primary role in life is to do everything they can to disrupt our democracy, to put them in a strong foothold position as the kingmaker now in the Middle East, which ultimately will threaten Jordan and Israel's security and give Iran and Russia a position that they never could have had had we stayed. And he did not have the humility to listen to his advisors, primarily Secretary Mattis, who basically left as a result of this decision. So you have a, a four-star general at your side who knows much more about these things than you do, strongly recommending to you that you stay. And he gets up and says, I'm leaving, and announces to the world with no strategy, no understanding of the long-term consequences. And this is a classic example of a lack of leadership and the fact that he is not qualified to be the President of the United States. Okay, two more. Uh, in the wake of the uh, murder of Jamal Khashoggi, yes. how do you think the relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia should or should not change? You know, you're just going to feed me with one question after another with another President Trump mistake and strategic error. Uh, how could we turn a blind eye uh, to that situation? So if I would have been president at the time, I would have placed serious, significant, acute sanctions on Saudi Arabia, and I would have cared less whether or not we sold them any arms. And basically, President Trump traded arms for looking at, a, at the level of humanity that was necessary to show the world that we are not going to condone a murderer. Okay, final question. Um, you said uh, that President Trump was not qualified to be president. Yes. Given that you haven't had a role in politics yet, yeah. what makes you qualified? So I've spent the past year and a half trying to answer this question for myself. Uh, because the next president of the United States needs to be the most qualified person that we all can recognize to be the leader of the free world 
and to do everything they can to elevate the promise of the country. The American people will decide if I should run, whether or not I'm the right person or not. But the issues that I think are central to the question are character, integrity, and the ability to build a large currency of trust and confidence with the American people. And uh, my life experience, I believe, has given me a level of understanding of people who are falling behind and don't have access to the American dream. And I've been fortunate also to be on the other side of wealth creation and understanding the responsibility that goes with wealth and with power. And I believe I can bring that. In addition to that, my heart, my sensibility, going back to the story of Normandy, is that we must, as a country, come together. And the first order of business of the next president of the United States is to bring the American people together. Howard Schultz, everybody. Thank you very, very much for the conversation. Thank you.